All right. Engine repair test 7 8. 1. Engine misfire is often caused by burned valves. What's a burned valve look like? What causes them to burn? Bad ignition Huh? Bad ignition I tell you what happens. The walls have to burn off. There is a lot of high stuff, high pressure power stuff going on. Huh? Valves open and they don't seat good. They don't seat good sometimes. Over time, if they wear it out, but you know these valves, they're trying to keep most of the time that they got these rotators that will turn okay. turn the valves around so that every time they open and close, they're and that keeps the seat clean and it kind of keeps them seating good. And, and so you don't see a heck of a lot of burnt valves. But when you do see a burnt valve, it's because some of the combustion process, let's say the valve was leaking a little bit right where the valve came against its seat. And that's like a torch. And after a, that, it burns some of that metal away, it starts leaking compression there, you see. And that's what goes on there. Matter of fact, when I was working over there doing that drivability work at the Ford place, you know, I'd get these vehicles sometimes and it would be skipping bup, 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 like that. And I'd stick a vacuum gauge on the intake, and the vacuum gauge, if it's bouncing real steady, then you got a burnt valve. That's just what it is. If it's got if a vacuum gauge is bouncing along with the mist, it's a burnt valve. Then you close the hood and they send it down the line, the guys do a valve. I got you a good question. Huh? In my opinion, it's a good question. Okay. On top of business, you know, someone's got a porch on it, it's like grooves. Like you mean like a bowl? It's like, it's like a, a bowl. It's like, like two bowls kind of sorts. Of yeah, bowl shaped. You're talking about where the valve, you know, you know talking about where the valve will hit the piston where it's got a dish in it. Yeah. It's like, you got your piston, you got your piston lights right here. Uh -huh. Except it's got dips in it right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is it for? That's so that, I mean, those, that's typically so the valve won't hit the piston if it gets out of time. Usually when you see that. How do they stop that with high rise pistons? Uh, they don't. <laughs> I mean, like I said, not all engines are not all engines are uh, are that way, you know. But whatever you take out, like they actually, I've, I've known of these people. Uh, I saw something in a some magazine somewhere where they were trying to give the valves and the pistons clearance. You know, when they had a camp, they actually had a cutting bit that was um, brazed on the top of a valve. And they would put that head on there, and they'd run the piston up the top. Dead. Well, they'd have the piston where they could move it, and they would start spinning that valve with that cutting bit on it with a drill. And then they would bar the engine over and let the piston come up and let that cutting bit make those little. But whatever you take out, you need to put back somewhere. You know what I mean? In other words, if you, if you take, unless you want to lower your compression, you're going to lower the compression if you do that. That's not metal, though. No. But that's typically for valve, for valve clearance. If you you know if you're not notice they're even shaped like the valves. You see, if you look at them, pretty good. Reformulated, uh, excuse me. Combustion is a chemical reaction between fuel and oxygen to create heat. That is correct. Okay. Uh, so reform. Huh? Huh? It's false. True. Yeah. True. True. And the next one's false. Reformulated gasoline was designed for use in areas with low ground level ozone problems. Come on. What is ozone, by the way? Ozone. You ever smelled it? No. You did. You just didn't know it. Isn't it like a different kind of oxygen? O3. Right. Yeah, three molecules of oxygen bound together. You know what creates ozone? High electricity. Lightning or any kind of spark. Yeah, sometimes they'll have these little ozone creating air fresheners and they'll have a couple of little electric grids and they'll be close to one another and they'll be going and they smell like a dead gum, almost like a burnt up electric motor or something. The ozone has got a smell to it. You smelled it. You just didn't know you were smelling it. Now, it's not harmful, but it is, it's like, wow, man, it smells like burning something up. You know, somebody loaned me this air freshener one time. They said it would make the house in your air in your house cleaner. Mm -hmm. And I put it up on top of the piano and plugged it in. And, bzzz, and I'd, I'd walk by that thing, and it had a little air blowing out, making that ozone. And, I, and it does clean the air. I mean, you know, lightning does that, too. And I thought, you know, this is really not a very good smell. I mean, it may be cleaning the air, but like we smell. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it actually was a four hundred dollar item because they had all this electronic circuitry in it, you know, everything. But boy, I, well, I don't know how much power it burned because I didn't run it all that long. I let, I let him have it back pretty quick. Um, most engines maintain between ten and seventy-five pounds of oil pressure. That's true. 
The rule of thumb for oil pressure is 10 PSI per 1,000 RPM. That's the minimum, okay? 10 PSI per 1,000 RPM. If it's running 1,000 RPM, I ought to have at least 10 PSI. Now, I don't like that. 10 PSI seems low to me. All right, if it's running uh, 5,000 RPM, it ought to have at least 50 pounds. You know? At least you know if you're at zero, you have a problem. Yeah, if you know that you're at zero, but you're, if you got an electric gauge, it may lie. Like my truck, it runs, I run 3,000 RPMs, like one wheel, one wheel down to 38. That's pretty close, yeah. You've been watching it, didn't you? My, my, uh, my Jeep, um, that, that one, that yellow one out there, it runs about 50 pounds most of the time, you know what I'm driving down the road. All right, number six, excuse me, number five. All filters or their mounting housings contain a bypass valve, which opens when oil pressure rises higher than passage pressure. That is true. Now, listen to this, guys. Let me say something about this right now before everybody goes completely wacky. The uh, If an oil filter, just because an oil filter fits and will screw on there, doesn't mean that it's okay to use it on a particular engine. You need to get the one that's listed for that engine. Now, most of the time, you can get away with that, but... Some of those Jeeps back in the late 80s, early 90s, I think it was, well, like maybe the early 90s, the oil pressure relief valve was actually built into the oil filter. And you had no oil pressure relief valve if you put the wrong oil filter on it, even though they looked just alike. And it was an oil change place just right down below the Ford place, and we also had the Jeep franchise and all that. It burned up two motors because... They reached on their shelf. They found an oil filter that looked right that would fit some of the other Jeeps. They said, well, that ought to work. And they screwed it on there and burnt the motors up. And we, they had to, the oil change franchise paid for us to put motors in. And I remember even when I left, those two motors that we pulled out of those Jeeps were still sitting back there locked up. I mean, you know, the engine, they were, you know, in the bullpen cage back there by the air compressor. They lock up. They just, because they had the oil pressure, was no, they didn't have any oil pressure because of the relief valve. They put an oil filter on it that wasn't built with the with the relief the proper relief valve, right. and there was no pressure. I mean, you crank it up, and because of the oil filter not being the right one, it had no pressure. Now that's something you will almost never run into. But the other day, who was that? Zach or somebody was changing the oil in one of these vehicles, and he had a pretty good eye. He says that this, of course, he didn't have to have too good of an eye to see that the oil filter that they sent for that vehicle was totally a different diameter and everything. I mean, it doesn't didn't look like it was going to work. Now the the thread was right and the gasket was the same size, but that doesn't mean it's okay. You got it. So we call the parts house and I said, "What in the Sam Hill is going on with this thing?" Because the guy that I talked to was a second string parts guy. You know, anybody that's ordered a lot of parts know that you got one guy you like to talk to, usually right. maybe two at the most. Yeah, one guy. Daniel Yeah, and uh, but the whole deal about that is the, the guy that sent the oil filter was not the guy I usually talked to. And so I said, oh, brother, I got these shoes here. So I called back, and he goes, well, that's the one that thing's listed for. And I said, well, that's not what was on it. I don't really, I'm not comfortable with it. I don't like it. So anyway, Brett got on there, and he did some research, and he said, well, they just changed some of our specs and software and all. And he says, and what we're getting from Purolator is that either one of those filters will fit that engine. In spite of the fact that they're different sizes, one of them is smaller because in some vehicles that big one won't fit. But you can use either oil filter. As long as your parts guy will sign off on that, but you need to make a note on your ticket. You know, the filter don't look the same, but whatever. Anyway, just keep that in mind. I mean, and, and, and what else did I tell you about oil changes? Don't start the oil drain plug and then walk away. In other words, you start the oil drain plug and you get called to the phone or somebody says, hey, can you come look at this? Do you come back? You forget to tighten it up. If you're getting called away, you make darn sure you tighten that thing up. Either that or leave it out. It's better to have oil all over the floor than it is to have it all over the road and the car sitting there. You know what I'm saying? That's just, that's just a word to the wise. You know? Number seven, the regulated toxic pollutants that are emitted. Wait a minute. I should have written number six. I'm sorry. Technician A says higher volatility fuel should be used in the winter to assist cold starch. Technician B says lower volatility fuel should be used in the summer to prevent excessive hydrocarbon emissions in vapor lock. C, both of those guys are right. The regulated toxic pollutants that are emitted by gasoline engines are A, HCCO, and NOx. Well, he got that one right out to start with, didn't he? 
You got it? That's it. Number eight. What government agency regulates the maximum fuel volatility level between June 1 and September 15 of each year? EPA. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Number nine. The lower, the new lower sulfur diesel fuel reduces formation of what? Yeah, number nine is uh, going to be a sulfuric acid a C. Sulfuric acid erodes the metal away, and it makes a mess. Key functions of the engine lubrication system include all of the following except increasing oil viscosity. to the next page. Blue by can result in all these problems except what? You're not going to get any white smoke out the tailpipe because of blue by. Now there, you got to classify the smoke. You have blue smoke which is oil, you got white smoke which is water, then you got black smoke which is hydrocarbons. Right? Alright, number 12. What organization tests oil viscosity ratings? Anybody know? Actually, it's API, the American Petroleum Institute. Okay, all that's considered as energy conserving is certified by, and that one is ASTM. ASTM. What's that stand for? I don't remember. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I don't want to tell you wrong. ASTM. Somebody do that. Somebody Google that for me. ASTM. We ain't got Google up here. Yeah, well, he does. He's got Google. He can, Google, he can Google it on his phone. ASTM. What was number 12? Number 12 was the uh, API, American Petroleum Institute. OSHA is Occupational Safety and Health Administration, EPA's Environmental Protection Agency, SCE, Society of American Engineers. API um, is American Petroleum Institute. And ASTM, darn it if I can remember what that one is. I know that uh, ANSI is American National Standards Institute, and UL is Underwriter Laboratories. Number 14, what develops, I mean, what defines the volatility of the fuel? The reed vapor pressure. Now, we had a, we had a kit for testing reed vapor pressure that they sent us when I was at Ford Place years ago. And what they do is they sent you something. Society for testing and... Huh? American Place changed What's the name of it? I don't know. It says, formerly known as American Society for Testing of Materials. American Society for Testing of Materials. I, I never would have guessed that. But anyway, uh, that's awesome. bad, ain't it? Yeah. We would take this cup, the little <laughs> coffee cup, right? And we had a little a cover that would go on it. And that cover had a little chamber in there. And you put 160 degree water in there, 180 degree water, something like hot enough to make coffee. And then you put some gasoline in here, a certain amount of gasoline. And then you would be measuring the pressure in here with a special little gauge. And over a period of time, the pressure, how much it rises over a certain period of time when this heated water is heating up the gasoline in a sensible chamber, that gives you a read vapor pressure. And so to test the fuel, see, they wanted us testing the fuel. They also sent this thing, they had a long plastic tube with a cable inside of it. And you put this special compound on the end of this tube, and you stick that plastic tube way down in the gas tank. Now, that's kind of silly because most of them got an anti siphon deal in there. It won't let you go down in there with it. I mean, it really wasn't good. But you can stay, if you can stick it way down there and you can let it drag on the bottom of the tank, and you shove that cable out of that tube so that it was exposed to the gasoline, and then you pull it back into the tube and you pull it back out. If it was purple, there was water in the gas. <laughs> Now that was sort of a dumb test because it was just too on some vehicles that you know you couldn't get it through there was a pain and all that. And well, some of them have a ball in there if you take the push a ball down and mm -hmm. it drops in there you can't get it. I know it's a mess. I mean you got, you got to be careful what you're doing with stuff like that. All right, now then, so number uh, fifteen, low octane fuel can be the cause of pre ignition and what? Detonation. Everybody knows detonation. Everybody heard. Everybody heard like pre-ignition. Pin. Huh? You said detonation. Yeah, which is actually like 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 like, like it's a, it's pinging. It okay. make it sounds like marbles rattling around down in there when you're accelerating. I thought you meant the car would blow up. No. Like detonation. No, it uh, well it depends on where you put the fuel, 
and what you and how you light it off. You know, you can blow the car. Up. But they're, they're talking about detonation being and, and detonation. This is what detonation is. Whenever your spark plug ignites the fuel, then everything's like it's supposed to be. But what if the fuel lights off before the engine is ready for it? Okay. The spark hasn't happened yet, but the fuel lights off because of pressure and temperature. That's detonation, okay? And that's the ping. Because whenever it lights off early, what's happening? That the piston is still on its way up, and it's happening too early. It's supposed to happen a little before top dead center, but if it happens too far before top dead center, it's going to sound like you took and hit a, hit the piston with a hammer. You know, because of that, those flame Sunshine. fronts come together to cling and make a thing. And you've heard, sometimes you may hear when you're excel or when an engine starts to overheat, detonation starts to happen. And you'll steer it, you know, making a racket. I went on a date with this girl one time, and uh, that day on the way home, uh, there was some machine out there that was, and they didn't have any signs or nothing. This machine was throwing rocks, little, little pebbles. I, I don't know why. It was some kind of road machine. And as I was driving along, I saw this uh, guy jump out from behind that machine and was doing this, trying to get me to go over. And I drove right through that hail of rocks. Now, they weren't big enough to break the glass, but they were big enough to hit one of the flues on my radiator and make a little tiny pinhole in it that I didn't know was there. Mm -hmm. So me and Margaret, we went to the Boondocks restaurant. We had some catfish and watched the alligator swim and all that stuff. And then we headed back to the house, and out in the middle of the country, my truck, you know, when I, when I was going, actually, we were going. The reason we had to go back to the house was because the truck quit. It got hot. We were actually going back to Port Arthur. But the truck started pinging and cutting up and labor knocking, and, and it got it got so hot that it just quit running. And then that's when I found out I had a little pinhole in the radiator, you know, because of them rocks. Well, I had to call my landlady. There was no cell phone in 1979. And so I walked to this trailer where this farmer lived, and he... I knocked on the door and he said, come in, and I went in there. And he said, I've got to take you to where a phone is. And he had a phone. So we went to somebody else's place and got a phone. I called my landlady, the landlord's wife. She came and picked us up and took him to the house, and we got my other car, and we finished our date or whatever. But the fact is, that 302, the next morning, fired right up. I mean, it got hot enough to where it quit running, but I put water back in, and it fired up. And, uh, and I was that's it. that engine got hot twice, so hot it quit running but for different reasons, and it still cranked and ran after that. So it was pretty tough, that old 302. But all right, now then, number 17. We're almost through here. The difference between synthetic and non synthetic oil is that synthetic oil is not made from a what base? Petroleum. Petroleum. All right. The pressure what valve in the uh, oil pump prevents excessive oil pressure? Relief valve. Now, what happens if you got excessive oil pressure? Why is that a problem? Yeah, uh, can you bear I have known of them blowing the oil filter slam off the car. Relief. Now, do you ever? Have any of you guys ever worked on anything that was old enough that it had a cartridge type oil filter? They're starting to go back to that. I know, but the ones I'm talking about, the oil filter was actually in a. I mean, on the down there where the oil filter is now, even on the old, you know. V8 Chevys, you had a bolt going through. The cartridge was in here, and it was a paper cartridge. And the bolt was, and this this uh, thing here had an O-ring up in the, you know trench where it went, and this would go all the way up in there, and it bolted that cartridge back on there. That's the way they used to do oil filters back in the 1950s. But uh, one time, Cliff Acreage was a guy that I knew growing up, and he had worked. At, you know, Cadillac dealership and all that kind of stuff. And this guy was so doggone sharp that if you called him on the phone, he lived in the community where I do, but he had a machine shop, but he ran up there behind the Napa store. And you could call him and tell him what a car was doing, and he would, before you even got through, he would finish telling you what it was doing, and then he would tell you what to do to fix it. Almost without fail. He was really good. And these crazy problems, like you... Like we had this car at the gas station over there one time I was working on, and it was a, some kind of old muscle car. And it would make the muffler so red hot that it would cause the carpet to smoke on the inside of the car. And he says, and, and this is crazy stuff, but he says you either got one of two problems. You have 
the ignition timing is off or you got a vacuum leak. And we found a vacuum leak. That caused it to heal. It did that time. I mean, it was, some of that stuff won't cause it every time, but he knew that. But one day he told me when I was talking to him, he says, uh, when he was at the Cadillac dealership, uh, he, he was a sort of a, of a foreman that had a crew that worked under him at the dealership. And there was another guy that was a shop foreman that had a crew that worked under him, and they had a lot of car Cadillacs coming through there. And he said there was this doctor's Cadillac that came in there, and whenever you uh, drove it up a hill or, you know, really got on it, it would just hunker down and try to quit. And so the other guy, the other shop foreman's bunch had been working on that car for, you know, a couple of days or something, trying to figure out what's wrong with it. And finally, that shop foreman says, Cliff, come and look at this car. And he sat down in the uh, seat, and he popped the accelerator to the floor one time, and the oil pressure gauge pecked out. And he switched it off, and he said, put an oil pump in it. And I got to say, nothing to that. He said, I bet you $100 an oil pump will do it. $100 is a lot of money in those days. And I, that guy made the bet with him. You know, because I ain't going there. I don't, I don't bet on nothing. Cause I too much I can't control, you know. But anyway... Uh, they put an oil pump in the car and fixed it. <laughs> but see, on this kind of oil filter, you won't blow the oil filter off the car, but that oil pump was strong enough on that old motor, it would choke the engine down and stop it from pulling. You know, if you got a hydraulic pump and it's trying to squeeze, you know, liquid and it can't squeeze the liquid, it's going to, the motor's going to hunker down. That's what happened on there. I've seen hydraulic pumps stall out a diesel engine. You know, see where I'm going? All right. 16. Huh? 16. 16 is emission, 17 is petroleum, 18 is relief, 19 is ILSAC. 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 The oil standard that combines both SAE and API ratings is known as ILSAC. I L S A C. That's another one of those acronyms. And um, I tell you what, the military loves to abbreviate stuff. Sean would be eating this for lunch if he was here right now. Number 20, uh, the what system prevents crankcase pressure buildup by returning blow-by gases to the intake manifold to be burned? The positive crankcase ventilation system. Positive crankcase ventilation system. Everybody knows how that works, right? <laughs> well, if you don't jump to this, why else? Huh? Like, 